Good morning, Strange Loop. Whoa. Ask yourself this. What do I truly care about? Is it improving the throughput of my web server? Is it even will I be able to use Haskell on my next project? Is it even uh, is anything about work at all, or about where my next holiday will be? I don't know. For many of us, I think it's actually these guys. Despite the fact that our children are incredibly labor intensive, despite the fact that they drive us to levels of exhaustion, frustration, and sometimes, I'm ashamed to say, anger, that we never believed ourselves capable of, even so, they are somehow integral to ourselves, and we treat, them, we treat their development and flourishing as one of the most important things in, in their lives, in our lives. Um, and that's what I want to, and in particular, I think those of us, whether or not we are parents, we would all think of ourselves as having a responsibility to give our children, our nation's children, our world's children, all of them, and a really good education to equip them for lives of richness and complexity. And that's what I want to speak about today, particularly about computing. It's a great joy to be at Strange Loop at last. I wanted to come from years, but actually it is my children who have uh, they've taken a lot of my time and attention, so I've not made it before. But I'm thrilled to be here. I'm going to speak from a UK perspective. Um, but this story about the reform of computing education is a, is a journey that uh, everybody around the world is on, and there's nobody has a monopoly on truth. I hope that some of the reflections that, that I've made, the thinking we've done in UK, um, will have some resonance for you, and I shall be here all today to, um, to talk to you if you'd like to talk to me afterwards. So let's start here. It's good to frame things in an ambitious way. This is a quote from Richard Riley, who was a Secretary of Education in the United States. Um, and he said, education should prepare young people for jobs that do not yet exist using technologies that have not yet been invented to solve problems of which we are not yet aware. And this is very real for me today, because my son Michael, who is 28, has uh, recently taken a job with IOHK working on blockchain, which certainly didn't exist when we were talking about computing education around the, uh, the dining room table uh, 15 years ago. So, how do we do this? Well, at school we typically teach children something about subject disciplines and something about skills. So by disciplines I mean things like ideas, knowledge, theorems, methods, subjects like mathematics, science, um, history and English, those are all in the subject discipline camp. In the skills camp, we have, we, it, they're generally skills that are to do with artifacts, devices, programs, products, organizations, stuff that we have made and how to operate them in a, in a confident and safe manner. Um, so we might think about presentation skills, about metal work, about textiles. All of these are good things too, and schools typically do both. So what has happened in computing? Well, in the UK at least, in the 2000s, this is the story. We had a subject called information and communication technology. So way, the was part of the curriculum that was about our, um, our stuff. Um, but, it, but there was no notion of a subject discipline. It was at its worst. We'll teach children how to use Microsoft Office. And even Microsoft didn't want that. Um, so, um, and moreover, by the mid-2000s, children mainly knew at some level already. They weren't necessarily very good at it. But there was no notion of subject discipline. So what's the, um, uh, there, there was, in short, too much focus on technology and not enough on ideas. Right? Indeed, the clue is in the title, Information and Communication Technology. You know, we're kind of from the, out of the starting gate, we're doing this wrong. So what's the obvious thing to do? Well, try to put the discipline back into the subject and to bring it back into balance. So here is the, the vision, if you like, the enterprise in which I think we are engaged. We'd like to make computer science into a foundational subject discipline that all children, that like mathematics and natural science, all children learn from primary school onwards. That's, I guess, elementary school here. Um, so that's, that's a big vision. We need to sort of flesh it out a bit. If we're going to sell this and, and speak about it to ourselves and to our, our nations, we need to um, say a bit more about what we might mean by that. So what I'm going to do quickly is to just rehearse for you the story that we now tell in the UK about what computer science is and why we might want to teach it in the hope that it may help give you vocabulary. These are things that have worked, ended up being, becoming persuasive. So here is the way we characterize um, computer, well, that I have come to characterize computer science. Think of it now as a school subject rather than as a dorky university subject for you know, uh, socially challenged males like, um, like me. Um, so uh, <clears throat> computer science is the study of information, 
computation and communication in both natural and artificial systems. So let's say a little bit more about each of those things. Start with information. So uh, here are two pictures. Which picture contains more information? Well, uh, it's a little hard to say even what that question means, but I might put it like this. If I was to be on the telephone with you and trying to get you to draw one of these pictures at the other end of the phone, which would be easier? Well, the star, right? I could just give you some coordinates you can draw. The Mona Lisa would take a little bit longer. So there is a reason to say one picture has more information than the other. And as soon as you do that, you get into, well, could you measure information? What units might you measure it in, right? And this, you know, get straight in, deep into information theory here. But at least it's a whole um, series of interesting questions about information, right, that leads to, you might think about binary in a less operational way than this is how computers do arithmetic. Second thing, computation. So this is what most people think about when they think about computers and computer science. And again, it's helpful to have examples. I often use the traveling salesman problem. Here it is, find a, you know, the shortest path through um, all the, uh, you know, the capital, um, the, uh, all the um, state capitals. But um, uh, it's a nice example because, uh, because it's NP complete, nobody knows a way to find the optimal path within the lifetime of the universe if you have enough cities. Um, and that's quite a remarkable thing. It's kind of Counterintuitive, you think computers can do everything, can't they? So that's interesting all by itself. Another interesting thing is that, you know, there, there are these approximation algorithms, simulated and Ealing as one, which can find really very good answers really very quickly, and they're really very simple algorithms. So there's some, there's some real cleverness there, and then you, but it also asks intellectually interesting questions like, you know, how close does it get? How fast does it run? Okay, um, here is a, um, uh, uh, an, an example of an algorithm that, um, uh, sorting algorithms that is done um, by my uh, um, friend Tim Bell in New Zealand. So he does this with primary school children. It's a sorting algorithm in which the children are standing in front of a network on the floor, and the rules of the game are that when uh, two children holding a number meet at a box, if the six is bigger than the two, so they swap places and move out along the, 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 the other arcs. So, um, and then they can do this simultaneously. So it's a parallel algorithm executed by primary school children in their socks. And um, then uh, you know, they, uh, they come um, all the way to the end. And miraculously, they are sorted. And even the Secretary of State Education, you know, he gives a little smile when this happens. And you can do it as a competition, and you can do it at a larger scale on the playground. Tim tells me that this t 15 seconds of video took him an entire morning to, uh, to achieve. So uh, it is an amazing achievement. <laughs> So why do I show you this? Well, there's something clever going on. It's clearly about ideas. It can't be about technology because there is no technology. It encourages experimentation. The kids might think, oh, maybe the teacher put us in the right order so we came out sorted. Let's try to fool the teacher and put ourselves in a different order. Oh, no matter what we do, we still come out sorted. They might ask, could we do the same job with fewer boxes and wires? They might ask, could we sort larger numbers? So it's, it, while some of these questions are quite deep, Right? It's, it, there's a sort of experimental, you could just, an averagely inquisitive child could try things out, and I really like that idea. It encourages inquisitiveness and curiosity, um, and it's plainly about ideas. Okay, communication. Information, computation, communication. Um, so, uh, again, you know, computers communicate a lot, and we often don't think about that so much, certainly when we're teaching it, but here's an example. Um, uh, Bill and... Um, uh, Bill and Jane have never met before. They're in a crowded, strange loop party with a lot of eavesdroppers, and they want to have a private conversation. If they could have a secret key but that they knew and nobody else knew, they could encrypt their conversation. Let's take that as read. But how do they get a secret key that they share and their eavesdroppers do not share? That seems like impossible. But it's called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, and your web browser does it whenever you engage in a secure transaction on the web. So I love it because it's, uh, it's, it seems like something that just could not be done, but by clever ideas, computer scientists have figured out how to do it. And moreover, figured out how to do it using a level of mathematics that an average you know, 14 to 16-year-old 16 year old can do. And, that's, and it really is a clever algorithm. <laughs> Another thing that's a point that's worth making to, um, uh, to people more broadly is that computer science is quite interdisciplinary. Here's an example which I um, really like to do with, uh, uh, it's a sort of crossover between um, computing and, uh, and English. Here the rules of the game are you put your finger on this, um, uh, uh, this thingy and you move it around, you follow, you follow an arrow and you say the word. So the old clown um, and the big pirate sang and the big uh, clown um, laughed. 
and then you go. So you're generating an English language sentence. So then you show this to children, you get them to generate sentences, and then soon they're writing new diagrams that generate new sentences, usually rude ones. Um, and, uh, but of course, they're also trying to generate sentences that kind of make sense. And so uh, they're, in effect, retrospectively reinventing the laws of grammar, but in a fun way. And then and you look at this, and then finally you can say, well, actually, this is just the finite state machine. And you can also use it to describe the states of your microwave oven, which is deeply mysterious to um, all people. Um, so the, you know, it's a sort of single idea that is useful in many, in many circumstances. And so there's lots of stuff about in teaching computing in an interdisciplinary way. So information computation, uh, communication. So let me just tackle a couple of myths. So one thing that lay people, you know, politicians, school leaders, will often think is computing, it's about computers, isn't it? I love this quote from Dijkstra. You know, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. Um, because it's, it's a little bit over the top, actually. Computer science is a bit more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. <laughs> But he had the right idea, right? Um, so I keep saying this, ideas, not technology. And the, uh, the, the, that stuff with um, uh, boxes and wires on the floor, that's called unplugged approaches to teaching computer science. I think it's profoundly helpful as a way to convey ideas without mixing them up with technology. Um, and also, think this, this uh, kind of thinking it's not all about computers is encourages you to look outside the, the artificial world, the built world, world of the sleek devices that we've grown so used to, and look at ants and uh, cells my colleagues at, um, uh, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge are doing systems biology where they, they really regard cells as kind of information processes, the DNA is in the program, and they're, they're actually, these days, they're writing code, and when you compile it, the, you know, the, the execution engine is a cell. Um, that's fairly amazing, and so it's a new lens with which to look at the natural world. But it's not just at the level of cells. You can look at the emergent behavior of ants and bees as they, float, as they run around the world with their tiny little brains that do rather remarkable collective things. So, not just about computers, it's about, not, it's about computation. And even if you think about computers, second myth is it's all about coding. So you will have seen a lot of this, right? So I have huge respect for, for, for Bill Gates, and actually I love all of this stuff about why we must teach our kids to code, but it's not only that, right? There's a tremendous amount. If you ask a person on the street what's happening in computing, they will say, well, we should te teach our kids to code. And we should, yes, we should, but programming is to computer science as lab work is to physics. That is to say, if you took the lab work out of physics, you would eviscerate the subject. You would leave it as a dull husk of itself. And yet, you would not put children in a lab with inclined planes and ball bearings and stopwatches and hope that they reinvented Newton's laws of motion. <laughs> so programming is super important, but it's also seductive and distracting and also can encourage a, uh, you know, a renewed focus on technology. One of my fears about this reform of computing education is that in 10 years' time, education ministers will be standing up and saying, we have solved the, you know, the computing crisis. We now teach our kids Python. Right? So we'll have unhooked ourselves from one pile of technology, namely uh, you know, Microsoft Office, and simply hooked ourselves on a different pile of technology, namely particular programming languages, or even programming in general. Does, does that make sense? OK. All right. So next thing we have to say, particularly when we're talking to schools and parents, is to say, why is this subject foundational? They might say, well, look, we don't teach law to every child. Lawyers, it's a sort of later stage of education. Why do you say it's foundational that every child should learn it? So here is reason number one, the one that I personally find most persuasive. Ask yourself this. Why do we teach every child physics or biology? Every child. Is it because they are going to become professional biologists? No, only a tiny fraction of them will do that. It's something to do with understanding the world and having agency in it. By agency, I mean some kind of power, some kind of ability to take control of events rather than be ruled by them. So I want children to be able to create computational things, not just consume them. I'd, I want them to be able to understand as well as use the sleek devices that they find in their pockets and feel so facile and familiar with. And I do want them to understand that it's just technology, it's not magic. Arthur C. Clarke famously remarked that any form of sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think it would be very damaging if our children came to believe, in effect, that the devices that they hold are, are kind of magic. They're made by other people. 
across the ocean, over whom they have no control, and which if they utter appropriate incantations, good things will happen. But if good things do not happen, then they are, you know, well, it's just magic. That's not good. They want a sense of empowerment. A second reason to um, teach uh, children, teach all children um, computing is because uh, it helps for all our young people to have the knowledge and skills to undertake the jobs of the future. And lots of them will involve, they may not be main, you know, mainstream, uh, they, you know, they may not be the strange loop audience, but there's an enormously bigger number of people who need to know something about computing. And this is both good for our, our world and our nations. It's also good for young people to have highly valued, well-paid jobs. Um, so you will have seen diagrams like this. I'm not going to pause here very long. Just to say the one message I want you to get here is it's not just the strange loop audience here. There's an enormous spectrum of careers in which some knowledge and, again, agency in computing is really important. Um, so it's kind of like, what's, what's, what's not to like? It's an intellectually interesting subject. It's deeply engaging as soon as you start to write programs, and you're going to get a really well-paid job. Um, but the myth is it's not all about jobs, right? So um, it's about tomorrow's jobs, not today's. And so I think that while employers, and I think employers don't want to play a um, what, should I, what should I say, normative role. The role of education is not to produce oven-ready um, uh, people popping out at the end of education ready to, to start jobs without needing no further training. It's to produce children who have a good intellectual and resilience toolbox and problem-solving skills um, in, you know, in an area so they can survive, so they can deal with successive ways of technology, which will happen to them. Okay. So two pillars, an educational pillar and a, and a kind of instrumental pillar. I say instrumental because it's about, you know, make good things for our world. So that's really helpful for politicians. Politicians like having a reason to say it's good for our economy. So I just want to finish this little section by saying, here, here's, so here's my, my sort of positioning then. The vision is on the left, but it's sort of nuanced a bit, and I've just articulated them here. Ideas, not technology. Every child, not just the, the sort of geeks, um, not just a narrow segment of people who become the software engineers of the future. An educational mission, not just an instrumental one. Um, and a subject discipline, not just skills. Okay? And these things are not, you know, it's, it's not an either or. A lot of these things are in balance. I do want children to have skills, particularly skills in programming and problem solving as well. Okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do about it? Uh, so just a very quick resume of what's happened um, in um, Britain. So in 2007-8, I was around the, uh, uh, the dining room table with my children talking about the really terrible education in ICT that they were then getting and thinking, I can't make a connection between what they are learning and the subject that is, I think is so fascinating that I have devoted my professional life to it. So then we, so we formed Computing at School, which is a kind of guerrilla group of volunteers to try to fix this problem. We hadn't got a clue how. Uh, we wrote a curriculum. Then, um, uh, then a number of things happened at national level. There was a, there was a change of government, and the, the then Secretary of State of Education, Michael Gove, instituted a review of the whole national curriculum. That was very helpful, because it meant there was, there was movement in the system. Uh, there, was a, 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 there was a possibility of change. Um, a pivotal moment was when Eric Schmidt, who was the, um, the, the chairman of Google, gave a, a well-reported um, well talk in which he, he said, in, in Britain, he said, I am flabbergasted. It's a good word, that. I am flabbergasted that you do not teach your children how to program in the, you know, in the land of uh, Babbage. And uh, I thought it was a bit cheeky, but it's not as if every child in the United States gets um, a uh, good programming education either. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, you know, it, it, it made me learn how a few sentences in a speech by a very able and senior, in this case, man, can have huge influence. It moved the conversation out of an educational ghetto into the political sphere. And suddenly, our own prime minister, then David Cameron, was saying, yeah, I think we should teach our kids to code. Um, so it was very helpful. Then the Royal Society, big 400-year-old um, august institution, produced this report that said, well, it said all the things I've been saying. That was very helpful, because governments find it much easier to listen to um, big august institutions than they do to guerrilla groups. Um, so then, um, in the end, as part of the review of the national curriculum, the government asked um, a couple of professional societies, the British Computer Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering, to uh, draft the new, um, the new curriculum for computing. And um, I ended up um, chairing the working group that wrote that. And the specification was rather good. They said to us, you can say whatever you like, Simon, but it has to fit on two sides of A4. <laughs> For 10 years of education in computing. That focuses the mind 
wonderfully. <laughs> so here it is. It's readily available. I'll, I'll give you a link at the end. Uh, but these are the aims of the, um, the English National Curriculum for Computer Science. And I st I'm still quite proud of them, and I you know I would say that. But look, every child should be able to understand and apply the fundamental principles of computer science, including logic algorithms and so forth. Every child can analyze problems in computational terms and have repeated practical experience of writing programs to solve them. Um, and then the other two aims are more applied, so we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so this, I think, is the first time any country has really embodied such clarity about computer science as a subject discipline from primary school onwards alongside other subject disciplines. Now, at that stage, we thought, well, job done, right? It's, it's uh, the national curriculum. We can go home. Um, but, but, we, but, we, but we could not. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's easy to think that once you've written a curriculum, it'll all be fine. But actually, um, the, uh, you know, uh, turning a curriculum into a living reality in every classroom in the, in the land is a huge challenge. Teachers are underqualified. Mostly they do not have computing qualifications. It's like introducing an entirely new subject into the school curriculum that's never been taught there before. Um, and schools are under intense pressure from lots of directions anyway. So computing is really not front and center on their radar at all. So it turned out to be a much um, uh, bigger challenge. It was a still bigger challenge than getting it onto the curriculum. Let me pause, though, just for a moment to say, um, reflect briefly on how did we get even to that point? Um, because these may have, these, these sort of lessons that we learn may have um, resonance for you. One thing we had a very singular focus, it was computer science as part of that vision that I said, that was our focus. It was an educational message, not just an instrumental one. We tried very hard to speak with one voice. If, if um, politicians and other, other leaders get lots of conflicting messages from different interest groups in, say, the tech community, they will not know what to think. Um, if they hear a single voice, that's much easier for them to pay attention to. Um, it was helpful that computing at school was a kind of grassroots independent group. It didn't speak for higher education. It didn't speak for employers. It didn't speak for teachers. It was a sort of broad church. That was very helpful. Um, it was really helpful to have support from professional bodies um, like the Royal Society. It was really helpful to have support from industry. And it was a place where I'm very proud to say that even though Microsoft and Google compete like, you know, fiercely at the product level, they're shoulder to shoulder on education. And they go to the government together. It's really helpful. Um, we didn't wait for the policy to change. We just got on with it, and I think that's very helpful. If you wait for policy to change, you'll just you know, die of old age. Just get on with it. Um, and I have to say that we were lucky. right? Michael, I, we didn't cause Michael Go to make a review of the national curriculum. We were really lucky about that. OK, so uh, what has happened right, about all this? So it's, it's a challenge. And three years in, um, uh, 2000, November last year, the same Royal Society produced another report. This is called, this is it. Well, this is the summary. The actual report is a lot longer. It's called After the Reboot. And it's a state of the nation summary of how things are going. It's readily available online. It's quite entertaining reading, actually. You might like to look at it. Um, and it paints a very patchy picture. Lots to celebrate, but lots to worry about, too. You know, a small proportion of the schools offering GCSE here means, GCSE means the age 16 national examinations. So only a very small proportion of our children are taking. Oh, a, a child might typically take about 10 GCSEs, but only one in 10 students is even taking um, a, a computer science as one of their 10 um, subjects. Uh, terrible gender imbalance, as, uh, as we're terribly familiar with, but maybe this would help, right? If we start earlier, um, maybe uh, we can help to address the, the um, tremendous gender imbalance in computing. Um, and very inadequate professional development. So it was a very helpful report to, um, uh, to just sort of give a, a, an, an independent assessment of how things were going. Uh, exam, examinations are not in a good shape. I shan't um, pause here. Teacher recruitment is difficult. Unsurprisingly, teaching is a very challenging job. It's inspiring, but it's very challenging. And if you're a computer scientist, well, people are queuing up at your door to stuff your mouth with gold. Are they not? <laughs> So I'm thankful that some people just in their hearts know that they want to be teachers, and some of them are computer scientists, but not enough. So maybe some of you, there are people who are leaving the tech sector in order to become teachers now, because at last we're teaching computer science at school. OK, so I want to spend just a few minutes on the kind of things that we might do at this stage, having got, you know, and, and this is true in many countries in the world. In many countries, there's, maybe it hasn't got the, this sort of every child from primary school onward stuff, but there's a lot of motion in many countries. So what can we as a, you know, tech community do uh, to help? 
So here are the things. Again, this, this, these are the things that we did that helped for us. One thing was to form a community of practice, a kind of grassroots movement just of individuals, not very institutional, this, um, to, uh, to try to push things forward. It's called Computing at School, and it's very much not, it's not like a subscription organization. You know, you pay your subscription, and you get services and, uh, you know, and benefits in exchange. No, you should think of uh, Computing at School like an open source project, right? It's uh, you bring, you know, some expertise and ideas to the table, and you get to share those with many other people who are engaged in a common endeavor. You know, it's a bit anarchic. Um, it's not, maybe even it's not very well led, but it's kind of, you know, we're on a mission from God to do something important. That's the, the zeitgeist of CAS. We, um, uh, we started a lot of physically local hubs. Britain is a fairly small country, and it's densely populated. So that's easier for us to have, get teachers physically together. That's very helpful. We built a large corpus of online resources, crowdsourced them, so we made it very easy for people to upload stuff. Of course, that means we've got a lot of stuff and not all of it is great, but the, the barrier to entry is low, and that was the choice that, that, that we made. We trained quite a lot of teachers to become teacher trainers themselves. So we gave them training, and then the deal was that they would then train other teachers in their local neighborhood. So it's very, the, the message that I want to get you is grassrootsy. We also developed some central resources. Um, here are some, these are, uh, CPD means continuing professional development, so this means uh, um, teacher training stuff. CAS is very much organized around supporting the teachers. We do no pupil-facing, no child-facing activities. We reckon that we can, if we can train the teachers, we'll be doing well. We'll be, um, we partnered with the Raspberry Pi Foundation, fantastic organization, also based in Cambridge, to, um, to develop Hello World. This is uh, the latest issue of, not, uh, this is an issue of Hello World. It's a uh, magazine written by teachers for teachers and available, you know, available for free online to everybody, um, and uh, actually to, for free in print form to teachers in the UK and elsewhere in the world. Um, so it's got very high production values. Do, do take a look. It's quite inspiring, actually, because it gives you a little window into the life of a teacher. I, I read this, and I think, wow, these guys are just amazing. Um, there are other, other magazines have been, this has been around for longer than Kaz, actually. Do have a look at CS for fun. So there's a lot of resources now available. That's not our problem, it's shortage of resources. One thing that we did not do so well, um, that if you're doing this in your country, I advise you to pay more attention to, is getting high stakes examinations right. High stakes national examinations, for us this is age 16 and age 18, drive everything in schools. They drive school behavior, it drives teacher behavior, parent behavior, pupil behavior, everything. You could have the best curriculum in the world. If, you're, if your high stakes exams are screwed up, your education system will be screwed up. So um, it's worth paying attention. I feel we didn't pay attention to, uh, to this early enough, and we're still sort of dealing with fallout um, from that. Um, but it's difficult because they're high stakes, so uh, changing them is hard, and it's rife with un unintended consequences. Third thing. Getting alongside teachers. So teachers are genuinely, I say this in a heartfelt way, they are our heroes and heroines. They are doing amazing jobs in the classroom. And we should love and support them um, and not make them feel ignored or overwhelmed um, or sidelined or marginalized. Um, as, or, or, or still less, you know, we've got this new subject and you're a crappy old teacher, so you're on the scrap heap. We're going to find shiny new teachers to do this. You know, we have to sit alongside our teachers and, and help support and equip them to do an incredible job. Um, but it is hard. Everything's in flux. Um, we don't have much experience about pedagogy. Um, so being a teacher, particularly in computing, is a tough job. As one teacher put, put it to me, they kind of feel isolated. They might be the only computing teacher at their school. She said, it's me or me or me. And that's quite hard. So that's, what, that, that's why the community of practice is so important. Um, so um, since computing is really is a uh, new subject that we're teaching at school, we do have an obligation to offer substantive training to our teachers, and that does cost money. So finally, with the... Um, uh, that, that's, there's just no way out of it. We, I think, and uh, government should do this, but maybe, you know, maybe the tech sector has to help as well. We've certainly invested lots and lots of effort in training and supporting teachers. But it's, because there are a lot of teachers, you need a lot of boots on the ground. This is a scale problem. But hey, people in this room know about scale. <clears throat> Another thing, research. So, Mathematicians have centuries of experience in how to teach mathematics, and they are still not agreed about what the best way to do it is. 
We have about three weeks, well, maybe, you know, three years or five, five years. We just have much less experience about how to teach computer science. Um, we have quite a lot at university, but still, you know, only um, two or three decades worth. Um, but at school, much less. And universities and schools are different teaching contexts. So um, I love this paper, for example, by Mark Guzdial, um, in which he says, the, natural, the way you think about teaching programming and the way that a lot of universities do teach programming is a succession of problems in which they say, here's a blank sheet of paper. Write a program to uh, you know, add up two numbers. Write a program to add up a lot of numbers. Write a program to do this. Write a, but at each stage, it starts from a blank sheet of paper. And he did experiments in which he said, oh, if, in which instead he showed, he, he got students to look at existing programs um, and modify, understood how they worked, explained them to other people. So he, he scaffolded the entire enterprise in a different way, he got much better results. So this is the kind of thing, if you know that, then why would you do it the other way, right? So we really need to study um, how to teach in, rather than have our individual teachers sort of learning it by gut feel in their own classrooms. That's just nuts. But again, it costs money. Um, so, um, the, the last thing I want to um, just mention by way of things we can do is um, uh, to do with formative assessment. Now, this is a project that I've been personally involved in. It's called Project Quantum. And I'm, I actually think that it, it could be, could be amazing. Um, so here's the idea. Every teacher has to come to an opinion about how their students are getting on. If you've got 10 students, you can have a pretty good intuitive feeling. If you have 500 students, you have to have some way, some more systematic way of doing it. So what do you do? You probably set them tests of some kind. This isn't the end of semester test that says, have you passed or failed? Have you flunked the course? This is the, um, you know, I'm putting a thermometer in your mouth at the end of the week to see, you know, have you, are you running a fever? Do you understand um, the stuff that we've been doing this week? Um, or not, and if not, what are your misconceptions and how could I help? So it's very much formative, that is, it's part of the learning process, not summative, that is, metrics on achieve levels of achievement. Do you get the difference? Super important. So quantum is all about formative assessment. So um, what actually happens, though, is teachers make up these questions, which is bonkers, because, number one, good questions are hard to write if you are an expert. If you are not an expert and are struggling with the subject, they are super hard to write. Um, you have to mark them. That's not good. That increases your workload. And worst of all, this is happening in every school. And what a huge waste of human energy and resource for teachers who are really very hard pressed. So the obvious idea is, why don't we build a corpus of, you know, an online corpus of questions that are of high quality and that can be shared by teachers, you know, in any country this year and the next. Um, and in fact. Um, uh, you could do this across subjects. And as well as being a useful resource, it would also have a sort of side effect of the, na the national curriculum in English, two sides of A4, remember? So that uses compressed technical language. It like um, use computational abstractions to understand the real world. You know, what on earth does that mean? So if you could say, here's 50 questions, if your students are good at answering those questions, you're probably doing a reasonable job of teaching that part of the curriculum. That would be really helpful. So it sort of incarnates what the subject is. Um, that's really helpful. And teachers, of course, can do them themselves. So Project Quantum is about doing exactly this. So we're um, gathering a corpus of questions rather than uh, paying experts to write them. We're crowdsourcing them so that teachers can write their own questions. That's helpful because often teachers have their own way of doing things and you know, some existing corpus is not going to do everything that they want. They're only multiple choice questions, which I was very sniffy about to begin with. But in this project, we've got, you know, international level assessment experts involved, and they have given me a crash course in assessment um, research, which says that multiple choice questions well posed are an incredibly good way of promoting learning. They are not just for babies. I don't have time to tell you all about that, but it is, it just, just, just believe, this is, this is something that's worth studying. So, it, it's not just for babies. So, and the last piece is crowdsource questions. What are we going to do about quality? Because many of them will not be very good, remember? They're written by teachers who are not experts. So, what can we do about that? Well, it turns out that assessment experts have been studying this for a long time. Let me put it like this. Suppose you have millions of answers written by thousands of students or hundreds of thousands of students to thousands of questions. Then, if you knew how strong each student was, which we don't, but suppose you did, then you could discover which were the good questions, because they would discriminate strong students from weak ones. 
And you could say for each question, not only whether it was good, but if it was good, how hard it is, because that's where the knee and the curve would be. OK? Nod? Does that seem plausible? OK. But if you, OK, but we don't know how strong each student is. If we knew which were the good questions and how hard each of them was, we could figure out which the good student, how strong each student was, because we just give them good questions and look at which ones they could answer. But we don't know that either. So what should we do? Well, now it's obvious, isn't it? We just solve a simultaneous statistical equation, this is called Vash analysis, and get the sort of best fitting model that will, um, uh, that will best explain the data that we see. And the more data we have, the, more, the better our model is going to be. Um, and so nobody's really tried to do Vash analysis at this kind of scale. This is sort of international scale. We want a single corpus of questions with you know, millions of students more around the world doing it. So it really rewards scale. Uh, so you get plots like this with, uh, this is the um, answers to the multiple choice question. The horizontal axis is student ability. This is a good question because it does discriminate good students from weak ones. Uh, so what happens over here, the, uh, you know, the weaker, weaker students start uh, all going for A, um, when actually the answer I hope is D. Um, okay, so that's quite um, a promising idea. So the, the, um, we've uh, assembled a corpus of 8,000 odd questions covering primary and secondary um, and covering you know, all of computing, not just computer science, uh, very much focused on low stakes and absolutely and, and free with a guarantee that's sort of free forever. So it's, it's all Creative Commons licensed. So my reason for advertising this to you is that there's nothing UK specific about this. These questions can be used anywhere in, in, in the world and you know, make, they would be packaged differently. You would put them in quizzes differently. Um, but I think, it's, I think it could be, could be seismic if we can get the virtuous circle of scale, right, of more and more, it's, it's big, so more people come to it, so they add more things, and we get more data, so we get better quality metrics. If that virtuous circle can close, it could be amazing. Sorry, this is just a bee in my bonnet. Uh, I, I, it, it's a good bee. Okay. So, we've talked about this quite a bit, but we, we do actually need to do something about it. Um, together. So Kaz's informal slogan is this, there is no them, there is only us. And what does that mean? There isn't a sort of smoothly humming bureaucracy of well-qualified educational and computing experts who are beavering away to, you know, write brilliant resources and train teachers around the country. It's not happening, right? So there's really only us. And gathered, you know, in this room, there is more intellectual horsepower creative enthusiasm and leadership capacity in this room than any other single room I have ever spoken in. Collectively, just the people in this room have the capacity to move the needle at national scale. But to do that, we actually have to roll up our sleeves and do something. And there are lots of ways you can do that. So you can, um, uh, you know, I put some of them here. Just finding a school, talking to the teachers, getting alongside them as an ally um, is an incredible thing. Um, run some kind of support mechanism for teachers in a local area, you know, a hub, um, to do, um, teach them a course about something they are interested in learning, um, write or develop resources, find local companies and tell them how they can help. There's a lot of organizations I want to talk about in a sec um, where you can, you know, you can serve as a member of an organization and start a code club or a code dojo. You could uh, just joining CAS and subscribing to Hello World, that's a good, good first step, you know, get, get a copy of it. Um, and, well, use quantum, right? Uh, but I do want to say, don't reinvent the wheel, right? So there are lots of amazing organizations doing really astonishingly brilliant things. Um, so I put some of them here. There's Code.org, Code Club International, the Computer Science Teachers Association in this country, the amazing bootstrap program run out of Brown University. Um, the uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation um, is, has an international focus and is not just a, it's not the, that's not Raspberry Pi, the company that makes Raspberry Pis. This is the educational foundation that has been, you know, is funded by Raspberry Pi. It's a brilliant organization. Teals, have you heard of Teals? Um, some of you, this is a, a program in which uh, people from the tech sector actually teach class. You get quite a lot of training. You teach class in high schools around, I think principally in the United States at the moment. Um, Code of Dojos are, um, as many of you will know, a sort of weekend or uh, evening programming camps for children and their parents. So it's really important to work and, uh, alongside and with and as members of these organizations, find out what's going on in your area rather than to start something entirely new that risks crossing over. So don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. Um, 
But it is important, it's, it's, it's no good, I think, being passive, waiting for somebody to tell us what to do. We have to be proactive. You sit there and wait for somebody to give you simple instructions for what to do, you'll probably be waiting a long time. Um, so you have to sort of make the running while still being you know, a uh, you know, collaborative partner in one of these things. So, but it means taking initiatives, that's what I mean by proactive. And it does need sustained input. So if you, as it were, parachute into a school, and then three weeks later something, you know, something urgent has come up and you parachute out again, you haven't really helped. In fact, you might have even harmed. So it's easier doing some of these things together with other people because making a sustained commitment for a single individual is hard. Right? So if you can partner with a group, or better still, you know, with your company and make a, you know, a corporate commitment to do something that, you know, under, under their umbrella and with their blessing, that's really helpful. Um, the other little caveat I want to add is that education is complicated. It is rife with unintended consequences. So it's hard to get things right, and we will fail, and we must be humble um, and accept that we fail, and also humble and listen to what other people with other points of view are saying to us. We, you know, we may be on a mission to um, uh, change the face of computing education, but that doesn't entitle us to steamroll of everybody else. We have to listen very carefully. Um, but the thing I really want to finish up with, just you know, do something. Do something as a result of today. Um, I just wanted to finish by, um, uh, just one, by returning to our children, giving you one tiny cameo of one child that I found very heartening. This was a workshop held in London. The cha this, this chap here is Miles Berry, who ran the workshop. And one of the children from a primary school who came uh, was uh, here called M, who uh, was um, uh, working on a, this was a um, uh, kind of turtle graphics kind of program. And she spotted that she could take, oh, drat, this, um, uh, this sequence of commands and turn it into a loop. She spotted it. And she told some of the students in her group. And that moment of insight meant that later, subsequently, her teacher wrote this. Here I have him, self-esteem going through the roof. It was associated, this is his, his words, associated this computing success with mathematics. Over the last couple of weeks, she solved maths problems, problem after problem, met target after target. She was truly flying along. That's what this is about. Right? That, that, that kind of sense of agency and empowerment that this young woman was suddenly went from thinking, think, you know, I can do this, I can make this computer do something in a, you know, in a more modular and brief and elegant way than it did it before. I find that really heartening. I don't know, do you? Don't you get that feeling? <laughs> So this is where I want to finish, right? So um, it really is about our children. I want our children to be engaged and curious about this amazing computational, informational, and communicational world that surrounds them. I want them to be empowered, informed citizens with agency, feeling that they can, they can do things in the world rather than they're somebody who's done too. I want them to feel creative and playful um, about this stuff, to be excited by the intellectual ideas that surround them rather than worn down by the, the, you know, the tasks. And, I, and yes, I do want them to have a job, and I think this will give them that as well. Um, so here is a, um, uh, here's a link to a lot of pointers to other stuff. I'm sorry, it's a rather, rather weird kind of link, but there you go. And uh, so it's, it's my sort of launch pad for um, a lot of pointers to this kind of stuff. And there I'll finish. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I do have some questions. I'm going to ask them to Simon. He can answer. Um, so the uh, many school districts, you have children laptops or Chromebooks as a way to help teach tech. Is What's your opinion on, on Oh, that? one, one yeah. laptop per child? Yes. Yes. So um, this, is, this is a slide I didn't put in. There's a, there's a, um, there's a whole different strand of um, education to do with using educational technology, including you know, a laptop or a tablet, as a way to improve education generally, to teach and learn better across any subject, be it history or science or mathematics um, or computing. So this is this I call technology enhanced learning. I think it's really good. In the school where I'm the, um, where I was, was for a long time uh, the chair of the, the board of governors for the high school in my area, and we indeed introduced tablets, one per child, um, into Chesterton about five years ago. It's been a huge success. But we should not confuse this sort of horizontal slice of using technology carefully, 
You have to be careful. You can, you can mess this up too, right, carefully to improve teaching and learning across the curriculum with a kind of the subject discipline focus that I've been speaking about in this talk. And it's awfully easy to confuse those, because we speak about this and people hear this. Um, and, and that can lead to misunderstandings that, you know, at, at, that you uh, best you know, just get rid of those misunderstandings somehow. So, yeah. I'm, I'm going to execute my ed editorial control here and ask things slightly out of the ranking order. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought this was an interesting question. Uh, there's a billion dollar children's literature industry to promote, motivate reading outside of school. What can we play an analogous role for computer science? To promote what, what out of school? Well, the, the, the point is that there's, a, there's this giant industry of children's literature to teach reading. What's the analogy oh. in computer science? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. So there's quite a lot of out-of-school club stuff going. Um, Code Dojo is an example. Um, Code Club is another. Um, I guess sort of Minecraft is another too, really. And some of these have been. <laughs> um, and some some teachers have actually adopted Minecraft to trying to teach computing through it. So I don't know whether that's really where the shoe is pinching, as it were. I think there's quite a lot of re engaging resources for out-of-school work and really good organizations that are doing it. I think the focus of what, what or at least what I'm interested in is saying, can we move that and put in the classroom as part of what we try, part of the education we try to give our children? So another way to think of it is this. Um, sometimes you look around a, a classroom or a room full of children who are working on computers, and they're highly engaged, but you have to think, what are they learning? So teachers always think, what are they learning? Um, so I want, I want to move from engagement to learn, which is not to denigrate this other stuff at all. Fantastic, and builds enthusiasm, but I really wanted to be at school. Uh, there's a question of, uh, do you think we should also be working to teach adults about the fundamental principles of computer science? Oh, should we teach adults? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, I mean, What's not to like? It's just so exciting, such an interesting subject, right? So yes, I mean, we have adult classes in history and uh, um, medieval Japanese poetry, definitely computing, right? Maybe we could have like a conference or something. Um, and actually, um, you know, parents do struggle with this stuff because they, you know, they think their children know more than they do. Uh, er, I think uh, we're getting, well, we got a couple more minutes. Uh, is there room for a more fundamental subject that covers rational thinking and philosophy as a prerequisite to computer science? Oh, would a, rational thinking and philosophy. My, my, Michael, that same, that same Michael who's now at IOHK, um, did take a course called Critical Thinking uh, in this sort of age 14 to 16. Um, so it was kind of like philosophy. I don't think I would make it a prerequisite um, because, remember, I wanted to start all this at age six. But I do think that computing can be a great way to, to think about thinking. Um, indeed, Seymour Papert, there's a famous Seymour Papert quote in which, because he's your, um, in which he describes children who are learning to um, write logo programs, he says, they are you know, doing something epistemolog epistemologically amazing. They are thinking about thinking. So, um, so I think there are, there are good links there. I'm not sure why, I, but I don't think I would make it a prerequisite for, to answer the question directly. But thinking skills, absolutely. I mean, every subject likes to say, we teach you good thinking skills. But in the case of computing, it's really true. <laughs> we might be biased. Uh, it, in the US, it seems like everything is a battle for teaching time, how to make the case for CS learning when they're struggling to teach math and other things. Yes, so this is, this is a challenge, right? So there's only so many hours in the teaching day. Um, so at a tactical level, it's it's counterproductive to get into a sort of battle with the mathematicians, a sort of zero-sum game. So in, in Britain, we were lucky because we had this subject called ICT, so we could sort of repurpose it. Um, if that doesn't exist at all, if you're fighting for space, that is hard on. I don't have a pat answer to that. I have wondered a lot whether um, it might be interesting to try to teach um, mathematics and computing as a, you know, as a single subject. Uh, rather than having a math silo and a computing silo, but that would be quite challenging. That would really mean not teaching, really teaching maths with a few genuflections to computing or vice versa. It would mean that they were really hand in glove and that would take a, an exceptional teacher. So I don't know how to do that either. I don't think I have, a, I don't, I have no pat answer except that. You know, somehow we want our children to have a good education and we must figure that out. Um, you know. uh, so. <laughs> 
So I think this will this will be the last question. Um, how have uh, coding boot camps affected education in the UK? Is that are they too focused on programming versus computer science? Um, boot, boot camps, yeah. you say. I, I think boot camps and, and sort of, uh, this is sort of an outer school um, camps that we get um, uh, for uh, encourage people to do programming have had a, you know, a huge effect for probably actually for the more privileged slice of children. Um, so it's not, it's not very good for um, in, inclusion usually. They try, hard though they would try to get children from diverse backgrounds. That's another thing about mainstream education. It's every child. That's very, super important. So I think, you know, wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm filled with admiration for people like um, Bootstrap who do lots of this out of school education stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but it's not enough. Um, and we have, to, we have to fix this. And we can. I should say, particularly in the States, um, the um, uh, K, um, uh, K 12 CS I put there, I, th th there's a big work on building curriculum part of the common core curriculum in this country so that computing can be, computer science can be part of the, you know, the, the extent to which you have a national curriculum, which is not at all. But uh, there's this common core thing. It's, you know, computing is moving into the common core. So lots of stuff is happening in this country too. Um, so. Okay, I think we're at time. Uh, great, go uh, to thank it. Thank you so much. Do something.